Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're taking a look today at the all-new Fire TV Cube. This is the second generation of this TV streaming box from Amazon. It now has a much faster processor. If you recall, last year's version had the same processor as their lower-priced Fire TV. This one stands out a bit on performance, but I do think enthusiasts might be disappointed still. And what we're going to be doing in this review is looking at it from a consumer perspective, but also from an enthusiast perspective. And I'll give you some recommendations for both use cases. Now, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this new cube is all about. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. This sells for $120 at the time I'm recording this video, but as you know, Amazon often has sales on these things. Uh, it's shiny and will pick up fingerprints and dust pretty readily here, as you can see, so you may have to dust it off every once in a while. Uh, on the back, it has the same unfortunate mix of ports that the last one did. I'm most disappointed with the USB port they chose for this because this is just one of your regular micro USB connectors. Uh, what you can do with this is use the included Ethernet adapter that comes in the box. And I use this in my home theater room to get the best performance for streaming. And if you have an Ethernet connection near your TV, I would suggest using this. However, this is only a 100 megabit connection. And that's important for enthusiasts to know because enthusiasts are often streaming video that goes beyond 100 megabits per second. And if you plan to do that with some 4K movie rips and whatnot, this will not support that given that it doesn't have the bandwidth. It does have wireless AC on board. You might be able to make it work there, but wireless is rarely a good solution for streaming that level of video. So that was a big disappointment here with this new product. It can support faster USB and doesn't. Uh, next to it is an infrared blaster, and that's also included in the box. And if you have older equipment that can't be controlled via HDMI, uh, or you have equipment that's outside the field of view for its internal IR blaster, you can set this up in an area where your equipment is and be able to control it that way. As you'll see in a few minutes, the Amazon uh, system here really does quite well at universal device control. It's probably the best thing out on the market for that. And it's really cool that you can execute multiple commands uh, just by asking the device to do stuff for you. It really works quite well. That's the real strength of this device. And again, we'll demo that in a minute. Uh, next to the infrared port, you've got an HDMI output. Uh, they do not have an HDMI cable in the box, despite the fact that you got all these other accessories in there. Uh, so you'll need to make sure that you have an HDMI cable, or you, of course, can buy one from Amazon at the time you're purchasing this device. And next to that is the power port, and here is the power adapter. Uh, the cable isn't all that long, but I think you could probably make it work in your particular environment there. It is a 15-watt adapter. On the top, you have some buttons, and this is mostly for the uh, Amazon Echo functionality that this device provides, uh, because when it is plugged in, even when your TV is off, it will work like an Amazon Echo. So you can issue all the usual Amazon A word commands to it to turn your lights on and off, for example. And then you can also control your television when you ask it to turn it on. And that seems to work pretty well. You've got your volume control for its internal speaker up top here, along with a mute button. Uh, note that it is always listening, uh, but you can disable the listening by hitting the button here, but this is not a physical cutoff. It's just an electronic mute. On the bottom, you've got that speaker, which again is pretty loud, and that is pretty much it. A pretty simple device that is much like last year's from a hardware perspective, uh, but it does have some more horsepower under the hood. Uh, the processor inside is an AM Logic S922. I believe it's the S922X because it is a hexa-core and not an octa-core processor. It has only, though, 2 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM along with 16 gigabytes of storage. It supports all of the major HDR modes, including HDR10 and 10 Plus, along with Dolby Vision. We'll test that out in a minute as well. And all in from a media player perspective, it's fairly complete for streaming services. But again, there will be some issues enthusiasts will be running into. Let's boot it up now and see how it does streaming some of the basics. So here we are on the home screen of my new Fire TV Cube. And one thing that I noticed immediately was just how snappy everything pops up here. So we're going to load up the Netflix app here from scratch. Uh, you can see that it's got its little animation going and we are in a uh, pretty quick response here. I am connected via Ethernet, but this is really... 
uh, decent performance out of one of these Amazon boxes here. Uh, YouTube is now available on the Amazon platform. It was not before. Uh, but they've worked out an agreement with Google now so we can get all this stuff working with an official app. Uh, that, as you can see, is loading up very quickly here. Uh, the big differentiator, I think, with the Amazon Fire Cube versus all the other stuff out there is the fact that it works very well with different types of equipment. So when you first set up your Fire TV, it will ask you what you have it connected to. Uh, so in my case, I plugged mine into my AV receiver uh, the receiver then is plugged into the television and then I can switch between different things on my receiver to watch on the TV and have it come through my home theater system. And when you set this up, it figures out what input it is on the receiver and then you can issue voice commands like this. Watch Stranger Things on Netflix. And as you can see there, it turned on the receiver, it tuned it to the right input, it turned on the television, and then I could start watching the content that I wanted to watch. That was pretty cool. And you can set up additional devices here that can either work through the HDMI CEC controls or with the infrared blaster here. And let me show you where that's located. So if you go into settings and go over to equipment control, uh, you can add other devices by going to the manage equipment area there. Uh, so you can see right now I have a TV and a receiver configured, but I could add a cable box, a satellite box, a game console, a bunch of other stuff here, and I can have the A word uh, be the command to switch between them. So if I wanted to go over to my Xbox, I could just say, hey friend, uh, why don't you go ahead and load up my Xbox for me? It'll turn on the Xbox, turn on the TV, and you're good to go. If you're looking for that level of voice control, I think Amazon really does it the best right now, and this device might be a great way to initiate all of that. Now you have two options for voice control on this. The first is to use the remote control like you can do on the other Fire TV devices. And what you do is just hold down the microphone button here and say, show me the weather in New York City. Here is the weather in And New that, York. of course, will pull up the weather report. And if your television is on and your home theater system is on, you will hear the output uh, of the voice response through those devices. When those things are off, there's a speaker at the bottom of the device here that sounds pretty loud and can be heard across the room. It's very comparable to their uh, lower end echo devices and sound quality. So it really does give you two devices in one, essentially. And of course, instead of using the remote, uh, this one allows for direct voice commands. I did change my trigger word here, so you won't have to mute your, your devices here as I do this. And we can do something like, computer, show me the driveway camera. Okay. And now it's going to go out and ping my security camera on the garage here, and hopefully it will uh, come up and start streaming an image uh, to my television of what's going on outside my house. It did it a few minutes ago, but now it seems like, there it goes, uh, and I'm able to get that working. So you get a pretty robust device here that works across the entire Amazon ecosystem. You can also do content searches, so I can say, show me Star Trek The Next Generation. And what it will do here is go out and search for participating media platforms as to where I can find that show. Uh, so you can see here we've got uh, the series itself. If I click on that, it's going to direct me to something that Amazon controls first because, of course, they want your money. Uh, but if you go over to more ways to watch here, you'll find that it is giving us the option to watch it on Netflix or on Prime. Uh, but it's always going to default to something that can make Amazon money. And that's one of the issues you run into when you have a box manufactured by a company that also has a platform. They want to make money off the box, and therefore you'll be doing an additional bit of navigation to get to perhaps the app that you wish to watch it on. I was also a little disappointed, given the price point of this device, to see ads running uh, in my home screen here. You would think if you bought the premium device for what really is kind of a premium price these days for a TV box that you would not see the advertising, but it is here. So just be prepared. Uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff thrown at you to make Amazon more money. And again, that's the main driver behind these boxes. If you don't like this and you want something that's a little bit more agnostic to the different platforms, 
Uh, Roku is a good solution given that uh, they tend to be a little more uh, universal in what they give you in a search or on your main screen here. So I think the key differentiating feature with the Amazon Cube here is the fact that you can sit down at your couch issue a voice command and get the thing that you want on your TV to appear for you, whether it's a cable box or a Blu-ray player or a game console. And if your kids have a whole bunch of crazy stuff hooked up to the TV and the TV is never working the way you want it to when you sit down, now you can issue one command, have everything turn on, and you don't have to futz around with the remote to do it. And I think that's a real key feature here that really separates this from its competitors. So now we're going to venture into enthusiast territory, beginning with its performance with 4K streaming services like Netflix and Amazon Prime. Uh, the good news is, is that it does support uh, Dolby Vision HDR, which is great. It also supports Dolby Atmos for content that supports that Atmos surround sound. So that was good as well. But there are a couple of settings that if you are serious about your content, you'll want to adjust first. Let me show you what those are. Uh, we're going to jump into the display and sounds menu here. We're going to go to display. Uh, the first thing I recommend you do is turn on match original frame rate. If the app you're using supports it, it'll turn your frame rate down to 24p for films that were shot at that resolution. There's a bunch of Amazon content that is, and it will make things look, uh, of course, much closer to how the directors of those pieces wanted them to look. So I would turn that on first. Uh, the second thing you need to do is go over to the dynamic range settings, and you need to set the HDR to adaptive. And the reason is, is that if you have it set to the default, which is always HDR, it will leave your TV in whatever the highest HDR mode was detected. So in the case of my TV upstairs, it locked it in at Dolby Vision, even for content that did not have Dolby Vision attached to it. Uh, so if you had something that was just in the regular HDR10, it would not switch to the other HDR mode. It left it in Dolby Vision. And of course, content that didn't use any HDR at all was also st staying stuck in Dolby Vision mode. So clicking it over here to Adaptive uh, will allow the device to switch back and forth. And it was able to do so for me successfully with my LG OLED upstairs. And YouTube at 4K also works successfully. 4K 60 hertz content ran just fine on here like it did on the Fire Stick 4K as well. Uh, so all in a very good overall media experience out of this and the voice command is pretty cool. Uh, you can even do voice searches for YouTube content now too, which is a great thing to have on this device. But when you start going into some heavier duty stuff, it really begins to fall short. Uh, let's take a look at Plex, which has been an absolute nightmare so far for me on this platform. Uh, so we've got an episode of The Expanse here that I recorded off my cable system, 720p. This will play on even a low-end Android phone, uh, but nothing is happening here. Check this out. When you start it, all you get is that spinning wheel and it never plays anything. I've got my server up to date. I rebooted it. I rebooted this box a dozen and a half times. It's not playing anything. Uh, and also it's restricted ethernet bandwidth at only 100 megabits means you won't get uh, the ability really to play those 4K Blu-ray movies over your network either. So if you were looking at this as hopefully maybe the first Fire TV box in years that really addresses the enthusiast audience, this is not going to be it for you. And it's unfortunate because uh, the processor inside likely could meet many of our needs, but for this kind of stuff, it's just not working. I also loaded up another popular home theater application. Uh, it reports to me that it's unable to stream lossless audio through this box as well. Uh, so again, it really strikes out on a lot of the things that I think enthusiasts need in a home theater box. So let's move on now to some performance benchmarks. We'll begin with the 3D Mark Ice Storm test. And as you can see here, the Fire TV Cube is a very good performer. It even beats the Fire TV 2 uh, from three or four years ago, which up until now was the highest performing device. So it has the performance us enthusiasts want, uh, but it doesn't seem to have some of the things that we need to really make full use of this box. I want to pull up one more benchmark, which is the 3D Mark Slingshot test. Uh, there you can see it was also pretty capable, coming in at a score of 1,696, much faster than the Fire TV Stick 4K, uh, but of course not getting close to the Shield TV, which still remains the fastest TV box out there. Uh, and what really frustrated me was that I could not install any 64-bit emulators 
onto this box, namely the Dolphin emulator, because I was very eager to see if this might be a great emulation platform, but it's not taking any 64-bit APKs that I try to install. Uh, so that was another disappointment. Maybe a future OS update could fix that situation, but right now uh, you're going to be stuck with 32-bit stuff. That said, we did load up the RetroArch emulator and had uh, Dreamcast going on it. Uh, the Dreamcast seemed to run pretty well here. It was maintaining a pretty good frame rate as we were playing a few different games on it. So that was good. It looked good as well. Uh, we also loaded up the PSP PP emulator for the Sony PSP uh, games and we ran Burnout there. That one also ran pretty well. We did both emulators at their default settings just to see what we would get out of the box here. So overall, I have a mixed opinion of this device. I think if you are someone who's looking for a good streaming box and like this idea of being able to control every device in your living room with a voice command, this, I think, is a killer product. It really does that living room control quite well and better than, I think, just about anything else on the market, at least from a simplicity standpoint. Uh, so again, if you've got kids who have a bunch of stuff plugged into your television and you just want the cable box, uh, you can ask it to tune into a channel. It will set it all up for you, put the TV on, and you don't have to touch a remote control. And I think there's some real value for a lot of people with that, and I think that's what Amazon is banking on uh, with this particular product. Uh, for us enthusiasts, though, this really falls short. Uh, the hardware could do better, and we're not getting all the potential out of it, unfortunately. I'm very disappointed with the Ethernet choice here. 100 megabit is not enough for us. I was also disappointed that I could not get my 64-bit apps to install on here either. And those apps really would have shown you some of the things that this hardware can do. But unfortunately, it is what it is. So for the enthusiasts out there, this is not an NVIDIA Shield killer or even an alternative. Uh, but for general consumers who are looking for simplification in their home, I think this does have some value. And ultimately, Amazon knows their market, and there's a lot more people looking for that universal simplicity than there are looking for enthusiast horsepower. So we'll have to keep looking for our dream alternative to the Shield, but this one, unfortunately, is not it. But I can very safely recommend it to folks, again, looking for that universal device control and simplicity. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. And until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Mike Talbert, Brian Parker, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.